Okay, thanks. Uh, so yeah, first to acknowledge Amaya because that's actually her representation, but since she, she's not here, I'm gonna put voice on that. Um, so yes, as Xavi said, um, yeah, we've been talking about uh, CNNs and then good rule of thumb is okay, so the deeper, so the higher levels we add, the better performance, but then there is not much that we have said about to understand what, what's going on inside the, the network. So in, in this letter, we're gonna try to to make sense of the kind of knowledge that it's encoded within these kind of architectures. I want to be talking about this, uh, these different things. So starting for the first and the most simple thing that I think uh, Kevin mentioned, uh, one thing that we can do is just to try to visualize the, the weights that are once we train the model. In this case, uh, this architecture is AlexNet, so once this is trained for, for image classification, then you can uh, go to one of the layers, and in particular the first one, and then you can uh, directly, since this, uh, so these kernels are like a little images, you can just plot and then visualize uh, what they look like. No? And as he mentioned, it's like they kind of make sense. sense. So um, they try to look in the first layer to very low level features, and they try to look for, I don't know, different uh, textures, uh, so detect edges, detect changes in colors, uh, so they look like uh, the, the gap or filters that uh, they um, were traditional engineered. Um, then you can also do the same uh, on top uh, on higher layers, but on higher layers you don't have that easy. So you don't have. So it's not that easy to interpret what, what's going on um, because first now we, we don't have tiny um, images, so it depends. So in this, in this, so in this we have like three channels kernels. But in this layer, then we have 256 different kernels that they have dimensions of 5 by 5 by 96 channels. So that's not longer an image. So what you can do is just do, okay, for the, for the first kernel in the second layer, you can um, plot um, the different feature uh, kernels, the different weights, uh, to the 2D to, weights. No? Um, but this is not, yeah, not straightforward <laughs> to interpret what's going on here. You can, uh, this is um, yeah, like a, an, uh, um, an, a demonstration. Can, uh, you can train a, a neural net on the browser. And, and in this demo, you can see uh, as long as, so since, since you are training and as the network converges, um, how the filters, they, they, they change and evolve. It's quite, quite cool. Um, but yeah, so you can plot and then try to make sense of them. Um, but it's actually so a better thing that you can do instead of looking at the weights of the network, you can look at the, um, at the activations. So yeah, so given an image, what kind of activations do you do you find in a particular layer? Uh, yeah, so if you go again to COM1, this is uh, Alexander Architecture, trained for classification. Then remember the, the kernels, uh, they look like, a, yeah, so they look for uh, changes in the edges, changes in textures, and then if you look to the activation, so once you filter your image using those kernels, you get this kind of feature maps, right? And then, yeah, so it makes sense. So here, um, one of the kernels is looking to changes in the, looking to, to uh, vertical edges. Uh, this one looking for horizontal edges, so okay, makes sense. But there is, again, not, not much to, to, to say, no? We, we knew that kind of already. Um, you can do the same uh, at uh, one of the top layers. And yeah, so you, you, can, yeah, you can, can see, yeah, so for example, in this feature map, so this particular kernel in that layer is gonna, it's, it's lighting like kind of in the center. You can then try to map this to the original size. And yeah, so it, that seems that it, that's reacting to the face of, of, of this cat. But it's also difficult to, to make sense of all the different kernels, all the, all the different feature layers that you, you, you're getting. Um, yeah, this is another um, kind of a demonstration. So in this example, you can also go to the web and you can, this is an example of a M, uh, network trained with MNIST. And this is a 3D visualization. So you get like all the different feature maps, all the different activations that you get uh, for the different convolutional layers. And then you can draw one of the, uh, like one digit and then see like, mm, yeah, like in, in, in real time kind of, kind of how the activations, they, they change. And yeah, you can look like 3D, so you can move around and then see how they, they change the school. But again, uh, yeah, so there is nothing 
more than just looking at the activation stack to make sense, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's hard to, to say much if you don't do something else. Uh, so before to this something else, um, just a reminder, so the, recept the receptive field, so remember in a convolution, uh, one particular network is just connected locally to, to a window in the previous layer. So this is called the receptive field. And actually, if you go that, um, deep into the network, then you can yeah, associate the part of the input um, that is associated to that particular neuron. So having that in mind, uh, what you can do um, is to, okay, so you have a, a network that has been trained for classification again, and if you want to make sense, uh, so what kind of information is a particular neuron looking at, um, you can forward a bunch of images and then keep track in one, of, in one layer, one neuron, keep track of the activations, um, uh, so you, you know, the image and the activation. And then you can rank um, your images in your data set based on, yeah, so the higher activation. So, yeah, I rank my images that make this neuron to hide the most. And then if you, yeah, if you, if you do that for a lot of images and you look for different neurons, then you can obtain this uh, kind of uh, row maps. So, for instance, uh, in this paper, they found that one of the neurons, it's like specialized in, in looking at people. So it reacts the most. Um, when the input has a, a, a person on it. Um, then this other kind of reacts apparently to dogs and some things with texture uh, and, and so on. Oh, this, this neuron reacts to, to text. Um, and, and then you can also map the receptive field of that particular neuron back into your image. Um, another thing that you can do, uh, and they do this in, in this paper, is okay, so if you want to find uh, which is the region that uh, is more relevant to predict a class as a particular class? Um, they propose the, this occlusion experiment. So, yeah, so you take an image and you can forward this image and then, then get a, um, a score for, the, for a particular class. So what you can do is to take the image but put an, an occluder, a tiny occluder, and then uh, take the, the, the class score and then just keep track that where, where do you put the occluder? So for instance, if you put the occluder here, then you can, and then you ob obtain a score, you can keep the coordinates of this occluder with the score, and then if you do that multiple times, moving the occluder uh, um, along, uh, across your image, then you can get these kind of maps. So basically, this is what it's telling you, um, that, um, so if, if the class that you're looking at is uh, this uh, car wheel, uh, whenever you put the occluder on the wheel, your probability of predicting this class as a, as a wheel decreases a lot. So that's telling you that, okay, that, that it's, it's, it's important. So, the, so not all the parts of the image that are equally important to predict a class as a particular class. And this is, uh, yeah, so taking just the, the final prediction of it, so the neurons in the final layer. Um, but you can also do that at any neuron uh, of any, um, of, uh, at, at any level, so at any convolutional layer. And in this paper, they basically show that um, in one of the top layer, uh, so the top level is in the convolutional, so for instance, in, in pool five, um, the kind of kernels that you have them, um, they react kind of a, as an object detec the detectors. And, and they can also map, so they can repeat the, the, the occluding experiment to see uh, what region uh, for this particular detector was was relevant to predict, uh, yeah, so to, to fire, basically. Um, yeah. um, in this paper, they, they have an extension, um, so basically the same idea, but for assigning to different neurons, uh, so, okay, so neuron, I don't know, whatever, 38, is, is gonna be a cabinet, this is gonna be a bed. Um, what they do is to use mechanical torque and then show to the users a bunch of um, um, predictions, so the, again, also they, they, they forward a bunch of images and then for a particular neuron, they keep the images that activate the most and then they also do the, uh, the occluding experiment to see what region in the image and then they show all of that to users so they can annotate um, uh, yeah, the kind of detector that you have in a com, com layer. So in this paper, um, they do that like more clever. So instead of asking the users to annotate, um, they treat like kind of a, the, the same thing as a semantic segmentation. So they built a, a data set um, annotating uh, many different kind of textures or objects or, or many different things, and then they evaluate um, the overlap of the of the vision of the of the, of the regions where the neuron uh, fires the most uh, with with the ground truth masks. So they can kind of uh, 
yeah, to annotate uh, the, what are doing the neurons. Uh, this is a, a visualization of, of what they show in this paper. Uh, another trick to visualize uh, what, uh, what is the region in the image that it's more important to, to make the one neuron, in particular one, one class to fire, is to use uh, uh, the class activation maps. Um, this architecture proposes a, uh, like a variation on, on the, look, in, a nor in a normal <coughs> CNN. So for instance, uh, if you look at AlexNet, then you have, uh, after the convolutional layer, then you have a set of fully connected layers and then your final classifier. So what they propose, what they propose here is to just get rid of the uh, fully connected layers since you, you just don't, don't care. In these layers, you kind of, yeah, I don't care where are the things placed, but since they want to localize uh, what's the region that most activate, that is more relevant to predict a class as a class, they uh, remove the fully connected layers and then they propose to, from the last convolutional layer, uh, to do a global, uh, global average pooling and then create a, a fixed length descriptor. So I don't know if, if this is like 512 different, um, 512 depth, uh, different filters. Uh, so when you do global average pooling, then you have a 512 uh, vector. And then this is a, um, uh, the input for the final classifier that is gonna classify among the, uh, in case of ImageNet, among the 1,000 different classes. So with this architecture, uh, what you can do is to map, so for example, for if this, uh, network, if this um, image has been classified as an Austrian rare uh, class, then you can look at the weights, um, at, at the weights that made the classifier to take that, that decision. And then you can map these weights, so you can weight the different, the different feature maps in your convolutional layer with the weights of the classifier, and then kind of, yeah, so. Is what I was saying, no? So you classify a class as a class, then you take the weights of your classifier, and you weight all the different uh, filters that you have in your convolutional layer, and then you add all of them together. And that would, that's gonna give you uh, the class activation map. And this is actually very cool, because for kind of the same price, you, you have a network that it's able to classify, and as well, and as well to detect uh, what region, um, what, what, what region uh, it's, it's, it's helping you to predict. Uh, the class that you are you're getting. Um, okay, so this is uh, so far looking at the activations of a network. What else can we do? <coughs> so what we can do actually is to just take uh, advantage of doing the forward pass, but then also the backward back, uh, backward pass. And for instance, um, yeah, if you if you want to see, the goal is to visualize the part of an image that mostly activates a particular neuron. So you can, go, you, you can go to a neuron in any of the layers, so for example this one, and then you can compute the gradient uh, of it with respect to the image. And then, um, so thinking on that, as a, so you, you want a way to, to go back, no? so you get your activations, and then you want to get back, uh, um, kind of not, not an image, but to get back uh, what's the region that most activates this image. So you can uh, compute the gradient with respect to this particular image, and then set this gradient to one, and then the, the rest of the gradients in this image to zero. And then you back propagate back to the image. Um, and by doing this, you can find the regions in the image that mostly, uh, yeah, that mostly activate this particular neuron. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, this is more visualization. So if you can, in this paper, they do that uh, in a bunch of different images, uh, different levels. <coughs> And, and then they basically show, yeah, that's the, the thing that I was, I was mentioning before, that some of the neurons, they're uh, specialized in, in detective phases, uh, dogs, and kind of in the early layers to, to curvy uh, shapes and, and, and so on. And wh what is cool of that is like they do detect uh, some particular objects and you never explicitly told to a network to do that. And that's kind of nice to be able to visualize that they, actually the network is encoding this information. Um, yeah, so in the same spirit and uh, sim I mean, modifying the class activation map that I just introduced, instead of uh, doing any modification to the, to the original architecture, you can again uh, compute the backward pass. And then in this particular layer, for instance, um, you can weight the contribution of, of your channels uh, based <laughs> on, the, on the gradient, in the, in the average of the gradient in this particular layer. 
and that kind of is, is going to give you an improvement over the, over the class activation maps that I described before. Um, okay, and, uh, and lastly, uh, activation maximization. So, yeah, before um, I was talking to yeah, provide an information, so an image, provide an image, and then do the forward pass, and then going back, uh, try to find uh, an interpretation for the features for a particular image. But actually, you can do that uh, just to, yeah, to try to see what knowledge is actually encoded in the image. And for doing that, you can start uh, forwarding uh, an image that it just no, it's just, it's, it's, pixels are, are randomly set. And, and again, so the idea is the same. So for a particular class in this example, you can uh, forward up, up to the end, and then, and then if you want to see what kind of information the, need, the network wants to see, um, you can set, for a particular class, you can set the gradient of uh, one of the dim dimensions in the last layer to one, and then the rest to zero, and then back propagate back to the image. And actually, you can do that multiple times. So what, what we're doing here is optimizing the image that is going to activate the most a particular class. And by doing so, you can visualize, OK, what kind of input the network wants to, to see to, to classify a class as, as a flamingo. So yes, if you do this optimization process, then you see, OK, the network is going to be very, 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 very happy to classify this as, as a flamingo, and then just places flamingos everywhere. And then the same. No, can you, and actually, well, this is, makes, makes sense because you see the, the patterns, but they don't look like very natural. And to, in order to actually to generate these images, you need to uh, apply some, some priors to the image. So it's not, you need to apply some trick like, OK, by, by back propagate, but my, my image is going to have uh, L2 regularized. Otherwise, I, I want the image to be smooth. I, 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 you need to apply some, some filtering to remove the high frequency that is going back from, from, from the gradients. Um, so there is a lot of tricks that people apply to, to the image um, to regularize and, and make it look better. But um, yeah, one, one idea, which is actually very, very cool, um, is to exploit so what a very good prior, prior for an image, which is using a, a deep generated network. So a network that has been trained uh, using adversarial training that generates, uh, so that maps from a, from a vector, uh, an image. I think uh, Kevin is going to cover this tomorrow, so the adversarial training, so I'm not going to go into that. But basically, the idea is the same. No? So given you, if this is the journal network that takes uh, as an input an image, and then produces a classification, you want to find, in this case, you don't want to optimize the image directly, because then you see that they don't look very natural. Uh, but you want to optimize uh, the vector that is going to generate an image for this model. So basically, yeah, the, the idea is the same, but the, the prior that you are uh, using here, it's way more strong. So you get this kind of visualization. So these are the images that the generator uh, produces um, that make the, the classifier network to be very happy to classify this as a pool table, uh, this is a cell phone, and, and so on. So this look, I think, better than the flamingo that, that was everywhere around. Um, this is actually also cool, and also by kind of understanding and visualizing what's going on inside the network, you can uh, try to fool the network. And this is an example um, where, so basically the idea is, okay, so this, net, the, this, this image here is going to be classified as a banana, uh, like 100, almost 100% 100 sure. Is there any way to be able to fool uh, this classifier? And they show that you can uh, train like a, a patch. So you can take a patch and, and train the network to optimize a lot, a lot, a lot this patch to, to fool the prediction when you place the, this sticker to the, to the image. Um, yeah, so in this case, uh, toaster. So maybe you start from, from a patch that it looks like a toaster, and then you start to modify the images of a toaster to, make, to be very robust. To, it doesn't matter where you place that. The network is, on, is going to always, always classify the input image with the patch as a toaster. Uh, yeah, so this is an example. So yeah, they, they place so the, the sticker can be placed uh, in any different image and then any location and at different scales. And uh, this is like an example, I think. So yeah, so you, you have your image, 
And if you put a toaster, okay, the network still thinking that it is an image, uh, that, that there is a, a banana. But if you put the, the optimized sticker, then you completely fool your, your, your network. And this is kind of, yeah, I don't know, something to take into account. If you can, if, if you can, yeah, I don't know. If you can fool your classifier, it depends on what applications is not gonna be great to be able to do that. Uh, so something to take into account. And lastly, I want to talk about the deep dream. It's related to all the things that I've been explained. Uh, it's more like a fun application that, that anything else, but it's like cool. So the idea is the same. Um, you start off from an image and then you forward, and, and then you, um, you, can, you, you, you pick one of the, uh, of the convolutional layers, and then you set the gradients equal to the layer activations, and then you do back propagation. Um, but doing that, um, you're gonna find, um, so if, if the network has seen any feature uh, here, um, it's, it's gonna, if you optimize uh, it iteratively that way, it's gonna boost uh, whatever features you have found in this layer. Uh, and if you do that many, many times, uh, you can get things like this, no? Um, so it's basically like making stronger the kind of features that is detected in a forward pass. Um, yeah, so this is an example in examples of networks that has been trained on ImageNet. Uh, you can, uh, you get like a lot of animals because the ImageNet data set is full of animals. And you can get weird things like a pig snail, camel bird, like, uh, I don't know, many weird stuff that the network is just, yeah, it's, it's just making, uh, is, is boosting. And yeah, there's more examples and I, I think this is a video. So as I said, it's like more like a, I don't know, like an art uh, application than anything else. This is like, um, so you start random from, from a random image and then once you iterate a couple of times, you do a crop and then you repeat the process and then you just, yeah, do that like, yeah, infinitely times and yeah. Yes. So yeah, that's what I uh, prepare. So if you have any questions. <laughs>